before we came here to the room, Professor Greenstreet made a, a, a very useful comment congratulating the CDD for bringing uh, another speaker who is not from Ghana. And I think that it's a plus for the CDD to help us all reflect on uh, with the help of other scholars and activists from other parts of our continent and in the world. Our speaker tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is a Nigerian. <clears throat> Her name is Idayat Hassan, and she's the director of the Center for Democracy and Development, CDD, which is based in Abuja, and it's a policy advocacy and research organization that focuses on deepening democracy and development in West Africa. Prior to becoming the director, uh, Idayat had been, prior to become, uh, becoming director of the organization, Idayat was a senior program officer and a deputy regional coordinator with the Movement Against Corruption in Nigeria. Now, for a young woman to be fighting corruption in Nigeria, you can, you can imagine the strength of will. I remember when a former accountant general, was it accountant general Domolovo? Auditor general. He once said that if you want to fight corruption, corruption will fight you back. Maybe another time, Idayat might tell us how she's fought corruption and how she resisted the blues of corruption fighting her. Maybe another time. Idayat is a lawyer and has held fellowships in universities across Europe and the United States. Her interests span democracy, peace and security, transitional justice, and information and communications technology for development in West Africa. As director of the CDD West Africa, she has strengthened its position as a civic tech leader with a portfolio of projects, including analysis of the nexus between social media platforms, election processes, and electoral outcomes, using an app to identify electoral fraud and analyzing the use of personal data in political campaigning in Nigeria. In other words, She's worked to use modern technology in ensuring or promoting transparency in, elect in elections. Her work notably saw the CDD move from being unranked in 2013 to rising to the 11th position out of 94 think tanks in sub saharan Africa in 2020 by the University of Pennsylvania. Her expertise in the civil and democratic space in West Africa has been recognized and led to her membership of many reputable committees. She sits on the board of the Nigerian National Human Rights Commission and was recently added as a member of the National Peace Committee in Nigeria, made up of prominent citizens charged with maintaining peace during Nigeria's election period. Her insights have been utilized by security agencies, resulting in her involvement in the Nigerian Army's Operation Safe Corridor from its inception. Idayat has provided conceptual clarity on the Boko Haram phenomenon during its heydays, presenting analysis of the group's motives and methods at conferences in Nigeria and internationally. Idayat has been instrumental in several major projects, including the CDD's efforts to lead the fight against fake news, misinformation, and disinformation. This has led to partnerships with regional and international organizations, as well as domestic partners, to handle advocacy efforts and organize media training for, the, for journalists and fact-checkers. 
Her work has also been at the heart of efforts to strengthen anti-corruption agencies and their capacity to check errant politicians and participants. Her wealth of experience in the election landscape has seen the CDD become a valued partner of election management bodies in the West Africa region with an active election observer network in Nigeria. Our speaker, ladies and gentlemen, regularly appears in international and local media as an expert on the region and is regularly quoted in the BBC, China Central Television, Radio France International, Voice of America, Bloomberg, Washington Post, Financial Times, The Economist, The Guardian, and Dutch Vela. She is also well published in academic journals and development-focused platforms and is actively sought after for her opinions in, commis in commissioned and solicited uh, write-ups. She recently co-edited What's Up in Everyday Life in West Africa, Beyond Fake News, with Jamie Hitchin, a book that showcases the growing impact of social media in the social politics of the region. Idaya holds degrees from Lagos State University and the European Academy of Legal Theory, Brussels, and has been called to the Nigerian Bar. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the sister from Nigeria we are going to listen to. The wealth of experience she has is so much that you wonder how in such a young life all, this, all these activities have been accumulated. This is testimony that she is qualified to talk to us about the topic on the civic space in our continent today. And ladies and gentlemen, I am happy to introduce to you Hidayat Hassan from the CDD in Abuja. So, Hidayat, your audience, audience, Hidayat. Thank you very much. Only I'm not a Nigerian, but I'm also back home here in Accra. My home is just a few kilometers away in Koforidua, so it's home. It's not um, out of home. Having parents who were born in Ghana and half of my family based here in Ghana as well. So it's home for me, and I'm happy to be home. And I'm actually very honored that colleagues at the CDD Ghana have deemed it fit to invite me for this lecture. I think we are the two CDDs. We are twin in a pod, and we are partners in progress. And I've actually enjoyed working with CDD this last couple of years since I became the director, uh, which talks a lot really about also mentorship and how um, solidarity really matters. Even when Professor Boadi was there, uh, executive director. When you look at the age difference, like eight years ago, just imagine what an diet will look like. The kind of support I got, the kind of welcome actually did make a difference and also helped in terms of shaping who I have actually become today, really. So I'm very happy to be speaking on this platform and to be having this audience today. And most of the things that I'll actually be speaking on will be really not, I wouldn't go really theoretical. I think that's a part of the paper because I'm sure CDD Ghana will judge me if I write without a theoretical framework. But really, from my wealth of experience working on democracy, not just in Nigeria, but majorly across the West African region, adding the Sahel of Chad um, and Co. to it. So I would really like to share my experiences and see how we can actually move forward. Uh, from here. I know that for us in Africa, civil society has progressed this last couple of years. And fundamentally enough, it's not just the English-speaking West Africa that we have had the emergence or even the proliferation of civic movement. In Francophone West Africa, almost on daily basis, 
civil society are springing up, which is actually a positive that we should actually look at. And they are doing different things beyond most of us promoting democracy. They are also service providers. In COVID, they were willingly and available to provide services even while government are still grappling with what and how they can actually deal with this pandemic. We have become very active and visible in the public fair. In fact, back home, when things are happening and we are not making comments, people will say, Idiot, what are we going to tell the government? What is happening? Why are you people not complaining? We have become the barometer where the average citizens actually gauge democracy in their country. But in spite of this, we still have challenges. And, uh, but challenges do not operate in a vacuum. Also, we have to understand that civil society itself has evolved from the pre-independence movement or civil society groups, where we have the nationalist movement, or we even have some organized as women groups who worked and articulated to ensure that we have independence in our country. From there, we moved to civil society organizations who were like anti-apartheid movement, like the CDD where I work, who established in 1997 in London by a group of exiles whose ambition at that point in time was to ensure that military rule is over on the continent. And from that, most of these movements, our civic group, became democracy sustenance group at every point in time. We are watching, we are ensuring that we are helping to nurture this democracy such that since 2000, this will represent like how many years, like 23 um, years or 22 of unbroken democracy um, in Ghana, talking in terms of the elections in Nigeria is another 22 years. I think I'm wrong with my Ghana figure, but for Nigeria it's like 22 years of unbroken democracy, the longest we have actually witnessed on the continent and the same across West Africa is something that we have continually seen. And I really think that for us here, there are lots of groups to actually celebrate, from the Institute for Economic Affairs, the Ghana Center for Democracy and Development, who have provided this platform, HIDEG itself, the Sierra Leone CGD, and of course the Burkina, um, the Sierra Leone CGG, and the Burkina CGD, and of course the Nigerian-based CDD, all are civil society in the same class, born almost at the same time and with the same um, mission and objective. And today they continue to exist, they continue to stand strong and are even examples of what civil society should be with the transition that have actually occurred in most of these um, organization itself. But around the end of the 2010s, by 2012, we had another form of what we call civil society and which I have labeled the grievance, um, the grievance uh, driven civil society a la movement. Because what we've always known are civil society who are multi-layered, either issue driven or service oriented. So we are the issue driven one. Working on, working on elections, transparency and accountability, um, social justice, anti-corruption. But there are also service um, providers who are in all communities working and have even become a government, an alternative government on this continent in West Africa, providing services to the citizenry where the government are had in hard to reach areas. But all of a sudden we had by the grievance-driven civil society, um, also called social movement. And I think this is, of course, uh, interesting because they have done a lot of positive things, like we've seen with the Yanamea in 2012 in Senegal, amongst others. But despite this notable achievement, there are challenges that we really have to lay our hands on itself. And some of this is not just what we talk about. Most of the time we talk about, yes, the return of the military era, 
we talk about the shrinking civic space, we often do not mention that the action of uncivil actors, such as non-state armed actors, like the insurgents operating in the nooks and crannies of West Africa and the Sahel, are also contributing to some of the challenges that we are facing. And in one way or the other, they are disproportionately affecting the civic um, space on the continent um, itself. And while I've said it theoretically, I'm going to skip all those uh, uh, dots um, to, to just talk about the fact that civil society is nothing new. I think for us in West Africa, it started appearing uh, in the literature of IMF and World Bank since the 1980s and the 1990s itself. And of course, uh, but broadly for me, I'm defining civil society in West Africa from the point of view of a liberal, voluntary, multi-community association recognized and organized, of course, around issues by in the liberal democratic states. And here they include trade union, the traditional chiefdom, religious communities, human rights defense group, not-for-profit think tanks like us, hum, um, governance, activists, and even cooperative society, as broadly and expansive as possible. We have to start thinking of us that uh, way, and they continue to operate in different ways. I've earlier talked about the issue advocates and operation service um, providers as very, very important. Uh, sets of people uh, that we often deal with. And, uh, but an important session of civic, civil society in West Africa are the grievance-driven groups, which are becoming new and bigger, really, now. They are political actors, they are young activists, they are minority groups. They often join or form CSOs as an alternative to joining political party, be it opposition or ruling party. And amongst this group, we have professionals, some with certain ideological alignment, who want to experiment positive social transformation differently and outside the confines of the state apparatus itself. And they are beginning to dominate the landscape. When you look at 2011 in Senegal again, it wasn't just actors like ourselves. I think at that level, many people, maybe Emmanuel Akwete would have joined them to be protesting in Dakar. But what is important was the Senegalese rap musician, professors, journalists, and students came together and created the Yanama We Are Fed Up movement to counter what the movement leaders perceived as a perversion of the Senegalese political state space characterized by poor governance, corruption, political clientelism, financial scandals, and impunity at the head of the state in the cost of a rising cost of living and uncertainty. And similarly, we had the La Lucha in DRC Congo, emerging at the same time, all in search for the fight for justice. In 2014, we had Ballet Citoyen, um, the citizens' room. We were able to effectively mobilize youth and women to house the 27-year-long dictator, Blaise Kampori. This contribution has really aided a lot when it comes to democratic consolidation in West Africa itself. And what I really want to underpin here is that, looking at it from the beginning, when we were more of fighting for independence, till when we became democracy sustenance civic actors, and to now grievance driven. At every point in time, the evolution of civil society and civic space is reflective of the major political events in the region. So it's not out of place. It is what happens, what is happening that we are actually responding to uh, and at every point in time. So the civic space and political transformation are co-dependent products in our West African democracy itself, and we are often boosted by political crisis. So I think that's beginning to charge you in terms of what do we and do, 
and how do we do this? And I will quickly mention some of the positives we have done before I start looking at what are, where we are today and where I think we should actually be going. I think we have done very well when it comes to the area of constitutional reform across the 15 ECOWAS countries. There were hardly any opportunity, you are talking in terms of constitutional changes, that civil society have not contributed to it. I remember in 2015, at a point in time, we had like six countries effecting constitutional changes, which, we actually, which was basically to either elongate the lives of administration or to benefit them. But together as a collective, we came together, acting nationally and regionally, and we were able to quash and bring in positives on that dimension, uh, in that area. In almost all the 15 countries, we do have Freedom of Information Act in place, and that's also a positive for civil society, as well as our anti-corruption efforts, with even collaboration worldwide, when you are talking in terms of the Panama Papers and everything that we are seeing. So we are not just working nationally, we are working regionally, and we are working internationally here. And I think election monitoring is one of my favorites when I look at what CODEO actually does uh, in the region. I say that they are like first among equals when it comes to the way, as a collective, they have been able to organize to observe elections. During the 2016 elections, all of us were busy rushing to Kofi Annan to listen to CODEO to tell us who had actually won the elections. That is the extent of legitimacy we have actually been able to build in this work that we do. And even when you take, for instance, the Senegal 2019 elections, I'm very sorry, I'm very biased towards where our francophone uh, politics, actually. The 2019 elections are in Senegal as well. There were attempts by people to ask people to even boycott the vote. They shouldn't go out and vote. But group of civil society, organized as a two jam, which is a peace space, an association, or what it's wall of, people of the street. At the end of the day, they were still able to mobilize and get like 66% of the people to register and be on the foot. So what kind of positives can we start thinking of other than that in terms of what we have done? And in public health, when you look at polio eradication, you look at HIV, and even the COVID-19 pandemic, how the civic actors stepped in, you will see that we have actually made progress and we will continue to make progress. And I think one important factor that might not look so progressive, but which is still progressive, is that we saw civil society organize to even push they organized resistance in what they call to the remnants of the old world order in the francophone zone in a drive to reject the French CEFA itself. It was spearheaded by civil society groups from Mali, Benin, Burkina Faso, just to name a few. And today, ECOWAS is talking about a common ECOWAS currency, even if it remains an elusive dream we still have the hope that one day there will still be that echo. And these, of course, are things that civil society have actually been able to do. But this, my paper, we look at very, um, given the background, we look at two very important uh, key issues. The external factors that is militating against the civic space, while also looking at the internal factors which are hacking all the responsibility lies on us as civic actors to promote itself. When we look at these um, external actors, uh, external factors really, I think the first we would start thinking about is the wave of unconstitutional change of power in West Africa itself. This is actually undermining the vitality of the civic space. So look at it in Mali, in Guinea, in Burkina Faso, there has actually been a change of government, unconstitutional change of government. But what is striking for me 
at this point here is that by civic group, many view this as a dishonorable benevolence that they can live with or what they call an ad hoc survivor mechanism which can be adopted to restore hope instead of reading this action as a democratic recession that it stands for. So our colleagues that in the previous past were fighting against tenure allegation were the same sets of people now clapping, marching on the street to herald the welcome of these purchases in this country. I think this contradiction is a very big one and it gives room for us to actually um, to reflect upon. In fact, interestingly is that the, the civic group who rejected, who drove out Blaise Campori in 2014 and in 2015 rejected the Colonel Dindere coup d'etat and his RSP were the same who we were on the streets in January 2022 welcoming Colonel Paul Damiga's coup d'etat itself. And that coup d'etat for the first time was actually toppling the first civilian or democratically elected leader of the country itself. Now, the second issue will be the rise of these non-state actors, which I have earlier mentioned. Um, the evolution and mutation, the continuity and discontinuity of the civic space is clearly impacted by the contingency of the moment, which is that insecurity that is blighting many parts of the region itself. In fact, if I take it back to the coup d'etat, one of the coarser challenges is the failure of democracy to deliver development to the people. But even if democracy cannot put food on the table of the people, people do want security. I think that is the least citizens do want. Each time we are on the field, they are saying, yes, if I don't have food, or can I have security? So I'm able to proceed with my life. These actors, of course, are not just making our work difficult, but they are also contributing and giving opportunity to the government to actually restrict the civic space. Across the continent, you find the, a wave of what they call anti-terrorism laws. It even affects our ability to receive money. It affects even our ability to conduct our duties. I tell you at the CDD in Nigeria, we have one staff whose main responsibility is to file with the Financial Action Tax Committee. Not in, in, no, no job except that, because the higher our transaction, the more we have to keep filing, or else they will climb down on us. We have to keep reporting and reporting almost on a daily basis once you do any transaction that is more than $10,000 like that. And in the face of this growing insecurity, you find that governments are not just using the terrorism law to even impede where we can go to or who we can receive money. Earlier today, I was, I was discussing how in Mali, it became very difficult to work in Mali because the ability to transfer money to partners at a point in time was taught. Then later, it became extremely difficult and it affects the transparency system or mechanisms we put in place, even if we have to go through other means to send this money. I'm talking now of even internal factors affecting us, not the one that is actually being weaponized by the government, um, weaponized by the government here. Groups are being shut down for supporting terrorist activity in conflict zones, and even you lack access to certain areas. So in like in our Boko Haram area in, uh, in Bornu State, before we can visit some sites, we have to go to the military and take permission. Without that permission, you cannot get on the UN flight to go to Goza, to go to many places. And that permission can actually be rejected. And there you are going to service our citizens. Another way this, of course, has also been done is when they talk in terms of Yes, uh, fake news, hate speeches, and during process, uh, protest, 
we see increasingly that government is actually climbing down on the ability to give and to actually impart, to receive and impart information, really. Um, impart information, infringing on privacy, which are all fundamental rights, enshrined in our national uh, constitution, even in our ECOWAS supplementary protocol on democracy and good governance, and African Charter on elections, on democracy elections and good governance, and minus all regional and international framework that we have actually subscribed to. So if you take West Africa, for instance, out of the 15 ECOWAS countries, 12 of the countries have actually shut down the internet, with the exception of Guinea-Bissau, Ghana, and Cape Verde. And even increasingly, we are believing in some work we are doing at the CDD that, because describing shutdown is not those numbers of days you can think of. A shutdown we are finding can be for 30 minutes, can be for two hours. So in some of these countries, there is even likelihood that has been shut down that we would think is just the, sub, uh, the what is it called, not uh, the provider being uh, epileptic or otherwise like that. Um, otherwise like that. And um, the classification of shutdown really for us should not just also be on internet shutdown. But what about the shutdown of our voices? Where as academics, activists, we can no longer speak out without being sanctioned. At times you are on newspaper, you write op-eds, newspapers are climbed down, you speak on TV, they find the TV, or even online, the eight and virtuals that are targeted at us are quite a legion. Beyond the amplification or of hashtag to shut down what is trending, so today we can have all our hashtag, but they can choose to promote another hashtag, which we silence and become more amplified, shutting what we are doing at this particular moment down. And I think these are important ways we have to start thinking of what and how to do this. And there are lots of efforts to also curtail free speech. So if you look at it, Five countries since 2015 have come up with Cyber Crimes Act. Some have even almost replicated maybe the Nigerian or the Indian, Chinese one, like that. Prescribing jail term fines when we do not even have a real definition of what constitutes disinformation or its features, and it can be weaponized. While five others have actually modified their laws to deal with this uh, menace. And I think we should think deeply about this. Has government started thinking and defining in, um, peaceful protest or just organic protest as insurrection? And I'm sure in August we all saw that happen in Sierra Leone, where the protest of the people were deemed by the government to be a form of insurrection, minus the 2020 NSAS protests in Nigeria, where our government president said it was an attempt to actually remove him from office, not a protest by young people on police um, brutality. And at the same time, you find many countries are moving towards the Chinese model of digital authoritarianism. In fact, a shima of most of our countries have either visited China for training or they have procured equipment from China minus plus other illiberal actors to surveil us, to shut our voice, and in fact to listen to our conversation. So those days we have conversation on WhatsApp and we deem it to be safe are long gone because there are so much investment on being able to read and to listen to our WhatsApp call and read our chats at the same time as well as studying the internet firewall uh, work so that they can block social media or effect um, arrest. I think another important point is that the porosity between the civil society, political parties, private fair, public fair and media in West Africa constitutes a challenge itself to the civic space. And people and the political class are now 
capitalizing on this because they have seen it happen historically. So when you look at 1991, you find that people banded together, uh, but the young people, unemployed, excluded from political power in Mali, banded together to house uh, Musa Traore from office. They later came and established their own political party to get into power. Even with the Blaise Campore CDP, in his 27 years, he co-opted a lot of civil society as part and parcel of this movement um, itself. So both opposition and ruling party are establishing a lot of dubious alliances with CSOs to benefit from their mobilization capacity, especially around elections. And at times, to do their dubious um, bidding. And here I gave the example of Nigeria and Mali uh, as very, uh, and Burkina Faso as important uh, example. That even within that short period of Colonel Damiba in um, led M MSP, how led military transition, he had his own civil society. And since President Buhari became president in Nigeria in 2015, 300 additional government-sponsored civil society emerged. In fact, some of them will come to our office. They will not just write and call us names. They visited many offices to create blockade and accuse them of working against the government of Nigeria while threatening people even with bodily um, harm. So this recent slide, of course, the shivrics, this shrinking of the civic space is becoming more and more real. And you will even find it in press freedom, uh, press freedom itself. So if you look at the last seven years since 2017, from becoming a good student of press, press freedom, we have come to a place where media are, is becoming more and more restricted. And each passing year, 2021, we scored below our grade, and 2022, we scored even lower. So with each passing year, there is increasing decline, even in our civic, um, in our civic um, spaces across the West Africa uh, sub-region. But I think when it comes to the external actors, there are two important key uh, factors I would want us to really take away here. One is the rising role of liberal actors on the continent. And two is our work in the new face of this information disorder. The rise of the liberalism should be a source of concern for democracy promoters. And I think that for us in West Africa, it should be big because at every point we pride ourselves by saying that the third wave of democracy started from, this, from West Africa with the Benin Constitutional Conference of 1991. But in the last two years, we have seen six successful coups and two unsuccessful coups. If you look at Niger in December 2020 and Guinea-Bissau, February 2022 as well. And we have seen coup and we have seen what they call the correction coup in Mali, aside from the coup, of course, the double coup uh, in Burkina Faso. And I had a chat because they are parts and parcel of us. Across these countries that have actually experienced coups in these last uh, two years, there were converging trends. One is a history of contested elections. When you look at it from Mali, uh, Mali, even the Chadian, um, maybe Burkina, that is insecurity, Guinea, of course, tenure elongation uh, as well and insecurity, which is fast, not just located in the Sahel, but is fast spreading into coastal West Africa, such that Togo, Benin, and even our hosts here, Ghana, should start worrying like that. But within this framework, you have young people, a very young demography of more than 60%. This demography are people who have never experienced military regime or they have very faint idea of what it means to live under the military regime. They have the social media in their hand. 
as very active and they want democracy and good governance to, uh, they want democracy that will deliver development to them. It's all these challenges that the liberal actors are actually exploiting. They are not operating in a vacuum beyond the politics of geopolitics itself where people are trying to make new friends. But they are also exploiting what is happening on our continent. And currently, in fact, if you look at West Africa, you just have too many of them, not just the Russia and China, we are often fixated on. You have Iran, you have Turkey, you have even ones we don't even know are actually operating in our system or trying to grab a part of our patrimonial uh, hegemony itself. And we are seeing it in real actions. For instance, in Burkina, we saw how and Mali, how our own people came and worked and started demanding that the Wagner group be brought in as the savior to fight, to liberate them. After they themselves had invited France to come in in 2012 with over the Emanela um, crisis itself. But we also saw how they co-opted people like myself as Russia to speak for them as experts, not just forming disinformation as we like to put it. They are also right on ground, co-opting people who can speak as parts and bind them to, uh, to their side. And this illiberalism is helping to engender this shrinking civic space. It's not just providing harms or providing social media, it's providing an alternative to them that we should start asking ourselves, will we still be relevant? as democracy practitioner? What elections will we be monitoring when immediately after the coup d'etat in, in uh, Guinea, the first person the Colonel Dumbuya met was the ambassador to, the, to Russia. And after they agreed that there would be no, the mind will continue working. It was already a fair accompli. The same in Mali, as people were trooping in to speak to the uh, Asimu Goitas regime, they were posting it on social media. And after that, it was more like, what can we do? They've already been accepted by the people. That was what the impression they gave. And this is an interesting trend we have to watch out to. Professor Prempe made mention of Freedom House Index. But what we should note is that out of 12 countries that suffered the most democratic decline in, in the world, in 2021, I think five of them were actually from West Africa. And this trajectory is also reiterated in the newly released 2022 Freedom House Index itself. The second issue is the internet itself. The internet is a force of good for us because we have used it to change policy. We've used it to mobilize. We use it in our daily activities. But increasingly, the dangers of the internet is also beginning to challenge everything that we do, particularly as we speak about information disorder. Or either our work when it comes to gender equality promotion, it is challenged because the same actors are using it to reemphasize the role that are up in the offline space, online, is being used to confuse voters, is being used to sow apathy to the people, is being used to actually sell liberalism where people are querying the quotient of democracy itself and saying that what can this democracy deliver when you can get better roads faster and uh, without the separation of powers and checks and balances as impediment itself. And I think that as civic actors ourselves, we are not even left out in the attacks as we are bullied online. And some do have offline implications. We have seen people that after they abuse them online, they go to their house and they even attack um, them. 
So this information disorder is not just attacking democracy, the bedrock of all the work we do, either in peace and security, either in accountability, election promotion, gender equality, every single facet of our work, but also the successes we have actually recorded in the last decade. But how well are we equipped to address these issues as civic actors beyond framing it as is fake news, we have to start answering this question. Now, not to bore people, I'll just quickly go to the civil society part and round up since I'll make the paper available. I also think that we do have internal challenges that we will have to confront and has come with us as the civic space continue to evolve in this last couple of years. The professionalization of the civil society is one of it, really. Why it represents a system of solidarity and system of interest leading to the first case, the categories of believers that we have in all the Jima Boadis, Professor Karikari and Co. It has also created careerists whose only interest is just to work and to jump from one organization to the other. These do also have serious effect in our ability to transform the civic space ourselves. And in that light also, we have seen people who have come, not just as government organized civil society, but also briefcase civil society, which are actually led by individuals and which actually serve their own interest itself. The fact that we have not built on membership the way it used to be, means that civil society groups are no longer owned by people and we ourselves are gradually facing the legitimacy challenge ourselves if we are asked whose interest do we serve how many civic actors would be able to hope raise up their hand and answer that because increasingly there is actually a disconnect between us professor Primpe, you can answer that but not everybody can do have that itself and this lack of rural outlook is actually important when it comes to democracy promotion and opening up the civic space if we really want to be truthful to ourselves. Because nobody is able to protect the civic space more than the citizens who are actually affected by it. We want the civic space to expand, then we will have to improve on the quality of the citizens with themselves uh, as the panacea to this um, uh, to this issue and we have to work for our legitimacy in the eyes of the people and I used to say this joke that in Nigeria the politicians say all the time that it seems it's more lucrative to be a member of the civil society than to be a politician because every day you'll be traveling all over the world you'll be taking selfies and you'll be driving in four-wheel drive so why be a politician if you can be a civic um, actor um, how that looks itself. And we are also seeing civil society who are legitimizing illiberal actors. The Yeolo in Mali is an example of this. The same thing, we are also seeing media groups who are being created or who are collecting money just to publish press statements without knowing what is the origin of this op-ed or this press statement itself. I also think that our strategies is due for us to review as civic actors uh, currently. We push for policy change, we do advocacy, we do convening, we cooperate. But below the pyramid again, we have to see how this drill down to the people. And I think for us at the CDD, what we have basically done is that we have disentangled it such that people like Idaya talks to policymakers, but some of my colleagues are the grassroots people that we are increasingly, we have now become a think and do tank not just a think tank that is talking and talking and talking itself. And I think when it comes to the strategies, the donor agenda setting is also important because when you look at Guinea, for instance, why the FNNDC was busy fighting to ensure there was no tenure elongation, not one donor gave them money. Only one that gave them money is now extinct. But now people are ready to support a transitional arrangement, which could actually have been prevented in the first instance. 
then transmitting one strategy from one place to the other does not effectively work with all this talk about technology becoming important or youth-led movement has ways of addressing issues. Yet, the youth are very important, but they have to be mentored and have opportunities to collaborate with experienced individual and group, which we are seeing today with the caliber of senior actors that are present uh, at this CDD um, Ghana event. Then polarization within the movement itself, we are increasingly becoming more and more polarized, and we have to work on that, as well as our internal working of civil society. How do we make ourselves to be more organized? How do we keep our book open? How do we fight for our legitimacy? And how do we start building upon the next generation of civic actors are quite important. When I look at this room today, I ask myself that, um, how do we retain the expertise that are there? They are LinkedIn in Senegal, the Jean Mabwadi, the Jibrin Ibrahim, the Emmanuel Akwete, the Alim South of this world. They are growing older. We are trying, but can we fit that space? And how well are we also building people with those set of ethics, convictions, beyond expertise, who can walk the talk in the next decade? In the next decade, uh, as very, very important itself. Um, then I think the last point I want to talk about is we also need to think about remuneration as very important for civic actors uh, themselves. One thing I found quite interesting and enlightening with all the coup d'etat was the way the civic actors kept jostling to be part of the transitional arrangement, possibly if they had pension. If they had a very good remuneration, it would not have become as enticing as it really is itself. So in conclusion, I said that the civil society movement have evolved in the last decade with expansion into the professional model, grievance-driven movement, as some of the new faces, but there are challenges, both internal and external factors, that inhibit the civil society movement in the region. Some of these challenges will have to be addressed by the movement itself. The professionalization, the strategies, the better condition of services for staff, prioritizing pension and health insurance, addressing the polarization existing between us, and importantly, solidarity, which is what Wadamos is currently doing now. The absence of solidarity is inhibiting the work that we do. When I joined CDD, I was covering our West African work, and my work was always to bring people together in all those countries. Now as the director, to organize people for solidarity, I get tired. I have to pick up the phone, start calling people, begging them. There seems to be a lactage. We have to awaken that because together we stand. Uh, united, we stand. Individual, we can actually do little or nothing. And we also have to ramp up funding, but we must recognize at this stage that it is not the solution to our problem. And we must build this intergenerational gap between us, which we are already seeing and which I am a beneficiary of. We have to do more of that while building legitimacy. But we have to confront two and very important things, which again I go back to the digital as important itself. That as authoritarianism resurges in West Africa with coup and ratification coup taking place, increasingly flawed elections, restricting civic space, the trust deficit is also increasing. So as a group, we must push and transform to being truly popular and legitimate institution. At the same time, the ECOWAS do also have an increasing role to play in this. In terms of legal framework for protecting and nurturing the emergence of a true civic space itself, maybe then we can truly harness the potential of what they call the echoes of the people that we say we are actually moving towards. And finally, we have to situate our voices in this whole politics of geopolitics that we have been talking about. What is at stake? A lot is at stake when we talk in terms of geopolitics. But as civic actors ourselves, 
we have not made our voices heard. We have not made our alignment. We are allowing the conversation to be had over us. We are even allowing some of this conversation to be between nations and nations while we are just there as non part not non, I, I, maybe I, I am trying to look for a diplomatic word to use as onlooker, mere onlookers where the battle for geopolitics is happening on our continent itself. And for the information disorder, the ball is on our court because this is very, very important we must highlight. It's not that it is new to society itself. It has always been part and parcel of society in ancient times. The difference is the techniques, the multiplicity of techniques that is being used. The proliferation of actors, the reach of this, and the danger that it portends to democracy. So how are we going to watch? How are we going to act from this and stop talking about certain facts from fiction being difficult or making it really about fake news? Because even when it comes to elections, people's mind can actually be rigged before they get to the polling unit. The use of data-driven polit uh, politics makes people to make a lot of decisions without knowing itself. And the intrusion on our privacy is even making it very difficult for some of us to have genuine conversation with ourselves. So this has proven to be very important areas we really need to look at, looking inward and looking externally to get that civic space that we all desire. And this long, sustainable democracy, which we go back to the founding words, mission and objective of the two CDDs, which is making democracy to deliver development to the people. Thank you very much. Please keep it going, keep it going for her. Thank you very much. Please take your seats. Madam Hidayat Hassan, the Director of the Center for Democratic Development um, in Abuja, Nigeria, for that wonderful, wonderful lecture. It's the 17th Kuntini Akwamu Lecture. And I would want to, at this point, I know that many of you were nodding in agreement, those who were also disagreeing at some point. She's made herself available. We will take questions, comments briefly uh, before we wrap up this evening's event. You can continue the discussion if you're joining us on social media or you're on Joy News or Joy 99.7 FM. The hashtag is Kronti2022 and also hashtag Open Civic Spaces. The microphones are available, but I would want to quickly uh, do some acknowledgments. Uh, if I haven't seen you, I have seen you. Um, please, thank you very much for being a part of this evening's program. But I want to acknowledge the presence of the National Security Minister, Honorable Kandapa. Please, let's hear it for him. He's seated right at the back there. Thank you so much for being a part of this evening's discussion. We also have Dr. Kwesi Jonah with IDEC also with us. Thank you. We have Mary Ada with a GII with us. Thank you. We have Mr. Suleiman Abraima of the Media Foundation for West Africa also in our midst. Where is Suleiman? Okay, great to see you. We have Dr. Ali Dusedu, Head of Department, Political Science, Lagon. He's hiding right behind Mr. Emmanuel Akwete. <laughs> we have Madam Kathy Adi, Commissioner, NCCE, also in our midst. Please, where is Madam Kathy? Okay, she's out there. We also have Ms. Esther Equia Jemfi Esquire, Executive Secretary, Disability Council, also in our midst. Please. Thank you. We have, we have Reverend Dr. Cyril Fayose with the Christian Council, General Secretary, Christian Council. Okay, right there. Thank you so much. We have Professor Yebua Boating with the NCA, also in our midst. Reverend John. Apia Kuran, Pentecostal Charismatic Council, also in our midst, and you as well for being a part of this evening's program. At this point, um, if you want to ask any questions, you want to make any comments, additions, if I could see by hand quickly, the microphones are available, then we can take your comment. Do we have a comment from Mr. Etia? Do you want to make any comment? 
the deputy um, minister, the attorney general, deputy attorney general in the Ministry of Justice. We, we want to make a comment? Okay. We'll start with him. Thank you very much. I listened to you with rapt attention. And let me commend you for the delivery. I've been monitoring the activities of some of the CSOs. And as you rightly indicated, when it comes to funding, it appears those who fund right to detect how they also do their activities. I would suggest that instead of CSOs, try to rely on donors. I would say it's not a bad idea, but you must be very careful as to which donors you take money from. Because if you take money from donors who are not into good activities, they will eventually affect the way you also do your activities. So, I know Ghana CDD is a very formidable one. I know how they also try to make sure that they receive funding from the right sources. But my caution is that we must make sure we get the funding from the right sources, but not diluted sources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's the Deputy Attorney General. Any other comments or questions? I have my own question that um, I penned down. The issue about remuneration and the pensions uh, for civic actors, exactly where it should come from. It's my question uh, that we can pen down and then we can get answers for that. I see Mr. Emmanuel Akwiti itching. Is there a comment that we can take from you, Mr. Akwiti? <laughs> yes. Yeah, but but I, I'm wondering if indeed a civil society is to from outside, from dangerous sources. I think we're generalizing something. Um, registered civil society organizations are organizations with boards, with their networks registered, they are well known. If you go to the bank today as a civil society, a new civil society, an old one, um, to put any project money, they want to see the document, where it came from. They have access to your sponsors. So, yeah, I think civil society groups probably may be doing more legitimate job than two organizations. You see, political parties, uh, we don't know where they get their money because they are funding, their members don't pay the dues. I'm talking about Ghana. That will give them a lot of, you know, support that they need, plus registered supporters. So, the framework of civil society organizations are accounting for sources of funding. It's more stringent and very structured, which is not what you get from, with political party, who at some point could be part of civil society, and another point they say they are part of political society. Okay. Um, I think the most important thing for me is that probably the civic space um, has come under a lot of stress from the digital age.